In this chapter, we're going to talk about the last 2,000 years of urban development and some influential women who have really made an impact but ultimately failed at their attempts for renewed female control of society. While a lot of female figures have been lost to history, we can definitely point to a few notable examples that made an impact but were ultimately almost wiped from the historical record. The first one I'm going to talk about is Enedwana. Enedwana was a high priestess within the Sumerian city-state of Ur. This was after Shatalhoyuk and when our cities were going through that transition into that patriarchal and hierarchical structure. Enedwana is probably most famous as being known as the first author of any gender that is recorded in human history. She was a priestess to uh, the god Nana, who was the god of the moon in particular within Sumerian culture. As a priestess, Enedwana's job was essentially to write and transmute the messages of the god in particular through her dreams to the people in order to influence society. In these writings, which were essentially poems, Enedwana not only signed her work, but also made it an effort to say that she, within the writings, was the author. This kind of first-person perspective, as well as authorship, was unprecedented at the time. And of course, we only have limited archaeological records and written records to go off of. So this might be unique or a first, it may be a second, it might be a 100th. We're not entirely certain, but at this point, she's an incredibly important historical figure for all of us in our collective human history. What made Enhadwana really important in society, not only as a high priestess, was also her influence on the society at large and her focus not on her god, but on the goddess Inanna. It's a little confusing. Nana was the moon god and Inanna was the sun goddess at the time in this culture. A female high priestess was named to a male god at the time and vice versa but Enhedwana decided to break the rules in more ways than one and actually write poems or exaltations to the goddess Inanna instead of her deity in particular that she was assigned to. In these writings, she was essentially celebrating that female ideal of life, death, and rebirth that was very present in prior societies, like with the women of Willendorf. By going against the grain in this way, she was attempting to revive that kind of feminine focus despite Inanna becoming relegated as a second-tier deity in society. Eventually, she was almost killed for her efforts and was exiled, but eventually was able to return to society and her writings and poems one of the reasons why we still have her writings and poems is because they were copied by other priestesses over time for the next several hundred years. She clearly made a huge impact on the society in particular, or at the very least in the way in which women looked to her for guidance and a revival of this feminine concept. While her father was waging war with surrounding cultures, Enedwana was writing these poems to Inanna in a way to revive this female ideal. Another incredibly important female figure at a later time was Hatshepsut, essentially the fifth pharaoh of what was known as the 18th dynasty of Egypt. She was the second historically confirmed female pharaoh, but it is safe to say that they were incredibly rare in society regardless. Most of the time, women in this society would only become rulers if their husband or sons were unable or died and were very much unable to control their rule uh, over the society. Hatshepsut was no exception to this. She essentially stepped into a role by necessity and was technically allowed to rule by proxy and then as pharaoh uh, very explicitly after a point. It's important to note that this was not queen, but pharaoh, which was the masculine god-king within the culture. 
She did not rule as a female ruler, therefore, but she actually adopted male-female iconography, including a false beard, and she ruled exactly as a male pharaoh would rule. During her time as pharaoh, Hatshepsut enacted social reform, much in the way that you would expect having a woman in charge of a society that did have a delegation between women and male roles in society in particular. Many of her social reforms were very controversial. A lot of her work was in understanding the egalitarian aspect of the society as a whole and gender with regards to gender. Much of what Hatshepsut did was to try and enact social reform in order to bridge the gap between this gender divide in society. It makes sense, being a female pharaoh, that she would bring this into her rule. Unfortunately, much of the social reform that Hatshepsut attempted to make on Egyptian society was negated after her death. The reason that we know how controversial she was in some ways is again looking at the artwork that survives in Egyptian cities. Through the archeological record, we find examples of her name and her face being completely scratched out or being destroyed, which clearly showed an effort to erase her from history. We don't know everything that she did or attempted to do within this culture, but we know that she clearly was controversial and made an impact to some extent as the society attempted to go back to normal after she died. In future pharaohs, we see a continuation of prior pharaoh priorities, all of which were male dominated, which unfortunately shows that her impact was not long lasting, though we can imagine what it was at the time. Another influential female ruler from Asia was actually Wu Zetian in China. The Chinese culture was an incredibly consistent culture for thousands of years, much of which was actually isolated and therefore able to develop in that isolation to remarkable consistency. The structure was rigid. There were very clear top-down hierarchical ideals that were put in place on society, which was an incredibly large population also, even for its time. Wu Zetian became ruler because of the incapacitation of her husband, the ruler at the time, much as was the case in many cultures around the world as it was with Hatshepsut as well. She was very adept at the court before her rule and therefore had a lot of clout within society in order to validate her ability to rule. But in all fairness, she essentially took control herself. She understood the system, she understood a need, and she understood her people and therefore took it upon herself to be in charge of the population and enact social reform. There was a lot of corruption in the court at this time, as was common in many cultures around the world, and so her understanding and ability to navigate these systems was a huge strength to her ability to effectively rule them. During this time period, and especially her rule, China was being recognized at this time of what, as one of the great world powers. Its economy and culture were really recognized by the rest of the world, trade was more common, and her influence in particular was to increase that revitalization, to really improve the quality of life for the people that live there and to also bridge connections to other cultures around the world. While again, the record does not show every impact of her rule in particular, and this was a very large place uh, on the planet at the time, we still know that her impact was widely felt even though she was one of the only female rulers of this culture in particular. Future rulers, unfortunately, did not continue many of her reforms, as was the case with Chepsut as well. And we don't know clearly how her influence was felt over time, though we do understand that she was a huge inspiration for many other women down the line who came after her. We talked about Crete, and how that had a sort of continuation of that matriarchal or gender equitable idea, specifically with regards to communalism. Vietnam also appears to have kept many of these matriarchal systems, including female deities as priorities and also a more egalitarian gender role in society for women. However, 
During the Chinese domination of Vietnam in about AD 40, there was a lot of antithetical social reforms that were taking place based on Chinese ideals of society and the hierarchy and the structure within it. One of the ways that society in Vietnam fought back against this was the rebellion of the Trung sisters. They were military rulers that essentially took it upon themselves to rally the troops and fight back against these oppressors. The idea of women and two sisters taking charge and starting a rebellion is really, really rare in this time period. It's incredibly exciting. And it's really encouraging that they were so celebrated within this culture, even to today, for their heroic efforts. They understood the changes that were taking place in society through Chinese rule, and they understood that they needed to fight back in order to keep whatever they could with their existing society. They also understood that women needed to be at the forefront of this effort that they themselves had to take it upon themselves to get other people on their side, which was no easy task. Men in particular were a little bit reticent to fight with them, but eventually were won over by their determinism and their proficiency in battle. Though the sisters were ultimately defeated, again, their story lives on, and their spirit for this kind of fight for equality was an inspiration for many people in the society afterwards. For instance, there is evidence that Vietnamese society actually retained what is called a double kinship system, or a matriarchal system that dealt with not only the patriarchal line or the line of males in regards to genetics, but also the matrilineal line. So also paying attention to how women uh, birthed other women through time and what that meant for family lineages. There are very few societies in the world that actually kept a matrilineal system. And so in that way, it's not too surprising that women led this rebellion, but there was still a kind of struggle to get people on their side as they went through with this heroic action. But again, while they ultimately failed, they had a huge impact on the society and helped to create a memory of these sorts of pillars of society at the time. Like in modern day, it's very clear that women have always stepped up and attempted to regain this kind of equality of gender, whether from the bottom up through protest or from the top down in leadership at the city or state level. Women have always understood that there is an equality within our genders in our current society. As we wrap up this course in particular, I will introduce the following courses and what we will focus on as we bring our understanding of gender equality into contemporary cities and again into the future.